from the STEM Global Action Studios in New Orleans. This is the Let's Talk STEM with SGA's Dr. Calvin Mackey podcast. STEM Global Action is a national leader in creating STEM-based learning activities and delivering them virtually and in communities around the globe to students grades K through 12. Hello, welcome to Let's Talk STEM with Dr. Calvin Mackey. I'm Ken Sang, your moderator. Before we get started, let's introduce our host and, and fearless leader, Dr. Calvin Mackey. Hello, Dr. Mackey. Hello, Ken. Ken. <laughs> Ken. Tell me, I'm tell me. Studio. I'm in a new studio. Look at you. I, I am excited, man. I'm, I'm excited because I'm coming. people know, you know, they, they say Dr. Mackey and they hear STEM and they think about engineering. But what people don't know, uh, Ken, is that my first degree was in mathematics, right? I is went to right? Morehouse College, got a degree in math, and everybody used to ask the same question. What are you going to do with a mathematics degree, right? So today, I'm happy to have uh, two individuals from the Society of Actuaries to talk about actuary, actuary science, and really what you can do with a mathematics degree. So family, community, parents, young people, I need you all to tune in today because the world is about numbers, and we're going to prove it to you today. Today, our guests are Joe Wurzberger and Jamala Arlan for the Society of Actuaries. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for Thank having us. Thank you so much for having us. So first, uh, Jamala, tell us, what, what is an actuary, and what, what, what does an actuary do? Like, how does it impact our daily lives? Yeah, so I'll let Joe maybe come up with a formal definition and put it in a formula, because we're talking about math and stuff. But let me talk a little bit about how I think about what an actuary does. You know, over time, I've had different people, have, as I've, like, introduced myself and talked about what I do, you know, ask me questions like, actuary, like and they hear the word actor and think it has something to do with entertainment. I've heard people ask me if it has something to do with like being a, like a mortuary or a mortician or something like that. I've oh, had somebody oh. ask me if it has to do with horses. None of those things have anything to do with, with, with well, maybe not directly, with, with what an actuary is. The cool thing about being an actuary from my perspective, which I think can also make it really difficult for somebody to you know, pursue the profession and think about like, how do you lock it in? Is that it could be anything. You know, an actuary could be working in any field, in any area, there's a lot of opportunity. And as we think about like, kind of trying to formally define what it is and kind of increasing access and awareness, um, it's just really important to think about the diversity of opportunities for, for the profession. So for me in particular, um, I worked at insurance companies for the majority of my career. And which is kind of a traditional um, location for an actuary to work. But I've done a lot of really cool things um, in my career. Uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, I've done things related to developing cool, new, innovative insurance products. I've done things related to analysis of you know, stock market increases. I've done analysis related to the impact of pandemics, even before we were in the middle of a global pandemic, and, and looking at how things um, you know, could play out in a pandemic scenario. I've done analysis looking at things um, like analysis comparable to the Great Depression, even before we were in, you know, the Great Global Recession um, in, in, in the earlier 2000s. So really, a lot of analysis, I think about looking at past trends and, and things that have happened in the past and how they may impact us in the future, which is really important for, for a lot of different aspects. Um, from an insurance perspective, what I've worked on today is in the long-term care insurance industry. And that's really about how we think about the opportunities and, um, and, and solving for, for the issues that could be related to aging. So as somebody's aging, how are they thinking about um, having provisions in place to take care of themselves, whether it's you know it, having care in their home, having care in assisted living, as well as looking at ways to um, manage healthier living as people age. And you put that in the backdrop of insurance, right? Because in, there is insurance behind the scenes of it, but really what it's really about is helping people age healthier, age happier, age better, age in their homes and age with quality. So as you think about day-to-day -day society, um, especially with um, you know baby boomers reaching age 65 and retiring uh, relative to the population available to care for them, it's a really important issue in our society, how, how we have provisions in place to care for our elderly and, and making sure that they can age with, with dignity and, and um, 
you know, all those aspects. So that that's really what I do on a, on a day-to-day basis. And, um, you know, when we go deeper into this conversation to talk about it from a diversity, equity, and inclusion perspective, because what I do as an actuary is very different from what Joe does in actuary versus someone else. You know, what I mentioned before about kind of, because it's so broad to, 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 to really define, I don't want that to make it unapproachable for, for, for your listeners, for kids to be thinking about opportunities in math, because, you know, it's not as easy to put in a box as say like, you know, how to be a doctor or how to be a lawyer, because it's kind of new and different, you know, and that can make it a little bit challenging sometimes to go out on a limb and kind of pursue something that is a little bit harder to define because it, you can make it into a lot of different things. Yeah, I love that you went where you did with that because there is no one size fits all actuary, right? There's so many different kinds. Um, if I had to generalize it, you kind of teed me up that you're going to come to me for this, right? So if I had to generalize it, I would say that actuaries are business professionals who make or influence decisions that are affected by risk. Um, but the cool thing within that is for people who want to use math as a foundation to make a social impact, those decisions I reference, those often safeguard things in society that people value most. So you already talked about, you know, you're you're working to help people age with dignity, which is such a noble thing to be doing, but also things like access to affordable health care, you know, financial protection for one's home or the financial freedom to enjoy the retirement phase of life. There are actuaries at the heart of all of those issues and helping to make decisions so that society, um, you know, can, can live better. So, hey, thank you all for that, but, you know, I got to jump right in here. You know, I'm, I'm down here in New Orleans. And we went through Katrina, and we went through Ike, and we went through Yeda and Zeta. We've been through Ida. We have a hurricane every, every, like, well, I'm not going to say that. We've been having a lot of hurricanes. And that brings me to actuary science because we have to deal directly with insurance companies. And I think being in New Orleans and having actuaries on, it would be remiss if I don't ask you all the role actuaries play in, you know, in a and informing insurance companies about the possibility or the predictability of risk, so to say, because we hear that all the time in New Orleans about whether or not we're insurable and if you move here. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's coming out of some data. Yeah, when you think about, you brought up a really good terminology of, you know, what is an insurable risk? You know, and, and an insurable risk goes to the idea of pooling and sharing in, you know, potential outcomes. When you think about the origin of insurance, it goes back to, I think it's Lloyd's of London in the 1700s or something like that, where people got together, almost like a, commu a very community-based approach to the origin of, of, of insurance, where people got together and said, you know, you put your $5 in you know, to protect against a particular outcome. The idea is that not everybody will need that particular, um, you know, safeguard at the same level or the same amount or the same time. So as you get more people together to pool those risks, you kind of get this sharing of, of the outcomes and sharing in um, really supporting each other, really, when you think about kind of that at a, at a fundamental level. Um, and they are things that may not be necessarily insurable when you think about it from, from that context. Um, so a situation like you mentioned, like where hurricanes are so frequent and the, the destruction is so, um, you know, so horribly widespread, or you may have a situation where you think about, you know, the level of the land relative to sea level, the, 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 the location relative to where those hurricanes seem to just be going all the time. All those considerations are factored into the analysis that would be done to kind of consider one, um, is that risk really insurable? Can, can a company really um, pull together to, 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 you know, to support that in a way that, um, you know, that pulls the risk for that area? But also, you know, what is the cost associated with it? Because part of that insur insurability is, is the cost so astronomical that it may make sense to, you know, self-insure or, or kind of look for, you know, other, other opportunities. The, the other aspect of it that, that is challenging is the element of, um, you know, for any businesses, there's an element of profit that, that, goes, into, that goes into play. You know, Joe, yeah. I think what, what we could benefit from is like, just break it down. Like an actuary is, a, is it risk assessment and how does math fit into that? I think that's what we need. But based on the question I asked, like use New Orleans as an example, right? Because everybody can relate to that. Yeah, I don't yeah. have an answer. 
<laughs> you did great. You did great. Well, fill, fill in fill in some gaps for me here, Jamala. But I, I mean, Dr. Mackey, with you asking the question about New Orleans and and Katrina, like I was there for an X World conference not long ago and had an Uber driver who was sharing some of of his stories going through Katrina, and it was. It was heartbreaking in in a lot of ways as 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 not just a human, but with my actuarial perspective, because he was talking about some, you know, families who had passed down property from generation to generation and didn't necessarily have, you know, the paperwork of proof of ownership and things like that. And I'm thinking in terms of insurable risks, like we can't take away the heartache of people having lost their homes and the loss of lives, but like as an actuary, part of what we want to do is at least be able to have some, you know, financial support to help. You know, in, in those situations, and 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 goodness, the the you know poor folks in New Orleans who couldn't prove you know ownership of 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 homes and things like that that just that just broke my heart. So, so yeah, I mean, using your example, what actuaries would want to do is start with, you know, what were properties that you know were owned, where are they, what are the the risk characteristics of them, a lot like what Jamala was talking about, and the whole concept of insurance, right, is this pool risk. Um, you don't expect every single person to have a claim, but you want to have it such that when there are claims that the burden is kind of shared by the system. And so there's a lot of math involved with that. There's a lot of assumptions involved with that. And we talk a lot about actuarial assumptions. You don't know when the hurricanes are going to hit. And Dr. Mackey, you said it's all the time. It's close to that probably, right? It feels like it, but it's not. So there's you know different models that we use to, to measure the, the, the likelihood and the severity. And not all hurricanes, of course, are created equally. So there's the, the severity part that goes in. So you know, as actuaries, we talk about frequency and severity, but you can think of it as just how often do they hit and how bad are they, right? And that, uh, that concept can be applied to health or to fire or all these other things that go into it. But then there is, that's where all the math comes in is you, you, you put together all these assumptions, all these things that we don't know. If we did know them, we probably wouldn't need insurance. We don't know these things, but we know the likelihood based on the data we have. We have years and years of history of the weather in New Orleans and the likelihood of, of, of hurricanes hitting and where the homes are relative to water levels and levees and all these things. Um, and by the way, none of those things are static, right? It's changing all the time. So that makes our job harder, but also kind of more exciting and more challenging because you know this dynamic world that we're living in is changing all the time. We're adapting in real time to try to, to you know, uh, help people, protect people financially at least from, from these, these tragic things that can occur. Joe and Jamala, thank you for your answers because you know, as the founder of STEM NOLA, one of the things that we try to do is teach young people that the solutions to the challenges that we see in our environment, there's science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. The hurricane is STEM, but the solutions are STEM too. And a lot of the solutions that have to do, especially hurricane and how we protect ourselves and even gauge the risk are based in mathematics. So when people ask, what do you do with math? For my people in New Orleans, you say, what do you do with math? We use math to save ourselves. That's what we do with math. So one question I have, what are, what are some of the... Uh the skills and requirements to become an actuary? And then what's the average annual salary for the young people that are listening and watching? A lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let Joe answer that one. Because <laughs> <laughs> Joe, what are, what are the skills, and you know, what are the requirements? What do you look for when, you, when you're hiring an actuary? Yeah, so, there, uh, you know, again, with the, there's no one size fits all actuary. There's a lot of paths people take into the profession, but there, um, you know, if, if, if you want to start college, first of all, there are actuarial science majors at a lot of colleges, not all. And so there are a number of folks who, who do choose to major in that. But my major was mathematics. Uh, Dr. Mackey, I think you said that was yours as well. So we've got that in common. That's a pretty common uh, starting point, but there's folks who will go through starting with maybe a business degree or, or quite honestly, one of my best interns had an astrophysics and English or history, I think it was double major. So there's not actually a requirement for a specific major. Mm -hmm. What there is, is a credentialing pathway. So a series of examinations and other things that people go through, although largely after they've graduated and they're in the working world, um, but to develop and improve their aptitude within you know, the actuarial sciences. Uh, but if you go back from there to high school and younger, um, I would say that, that those STEM subjects are pretty key, uh, math in particular, but in general, STEM teaches a way of thinking that is really relevant for actuaries. Um, and I've hired a lot of entry-level actuaries in my career, I'm assuming Jamala has as well, so I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that in addition to the STEM foundation, 
I often looked for extracurricular involvement. Um, almost anything didn't matter to me if it was sports or theater or clubs or what it was, but that that showed a lot of the soft skills and the teamwork and the leadership skills that I think are crucial to being a successful actuary, as well as just the ability to multitask. Um, not just do well in the classroom because it's the one and only thing you're focused on, but to be able to do a lot of things at one time. Because I think that, you know, at that age, that's the best way in my mind to kind of simulate what adult life as an actuary is, is going to be like. Yeah, one of the hardest things, you know, for me, just like thinking back was, you know, I knew that I wanted to have a career in mathematics. That was, you know, when I was going to school in high school, like that was the subject that I liked the most and that I enjoyed the most. I, I love the application of mathematics, but it's really hard to think about like, what is a career where you're directly applying math? You know, sometimes guidance counselors, very noble and, and important careers point you, if you have an interest in math to accounting, um, no offense, Dr. Mackey, also to engineering, um, but you know, but those are not direct applications of, of mathematics. What? And, um, you know, not not in a, it's kind of it, it, it's purest form, and kind of being able to kind of have that joy. I'm and and tutoring a, a high school um, student in in math right now, and one of the funnest part of kind of going back to high school math and talking to her and trying to build that um, love for mathematics with her is talking about the application because she does ask me that question. Well, how do you use this? And I can actually talk to her about ways that you can use some of the concepts that she's doing. Um, in, in, in her classwork in real life, when I think about like the, the applications in, in, in my jobs. Uh, and, you know, the math teacher that I had, math teachers are so important and, and, and they're, they're unsung heroes. And, and really building that love for mathematics, I, I think often comes from having a really good math teacher to make it accessible, to make it exciting, to make it interesting and not make it feel so complex and, you know, just kind of think something that you have to do to, to, to be able to graduate. And, and I had, you know, I, I think the, the um, I, I was lucky in having a really good math teacher in, in high school who really cultivated that that excitement for mathematics and the interest in the application and um, you know there are a lot of really good organizations for 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 math teachers that support diversity in math like the Benjamin Banneker Association um, that, that are just so important and you know as we think about STEM and, and opportunities for um, you know just knowledge of different type, types of careers and it it really starts with having having good teachers in high school. Jamala, I definitely understand when you're saying you really wanted to apply math. So I went to college and I majored in math. I was poor in reading, so why would I go major in something with words, right? But I was doing all this math to start making my head hurt. So I said, I want like less math, right? Because it's making my head hurt. So I get the mathematics degree and I go over to engineering. And I'm thinking I'm going to go to engineering and have me in a lab. I do some experiments. But since I have this great, I had this great foundation in mathematics, they put me in fluid mechanics. So here I am once again doing theoretical mathematics, but on water, on the floor of fluids. And that's how I ended up back in New Orleans, because I became a professor at Tulane doing research around water and the flow of water. Got it? And, you know, in the mathematical representation of water and waves. So, you know, when you think about math, you put it in this box, but really it's applicable to everything. And we try to even teach the kids in New Orleans that at the basics, at the base of sound, New Orleans is a... It's a music place, you know, give birth to jazz, mm -hmm. but at the base of music and jazz is mathematics. So yep, yep. Uh, you're absolutely right about that. We have to go back and tie the knot, a close the loop with our young people to let them know that math is in everything. Now, with that being said, how about you all tell us about your DEI work, your diversity, uh, equity and inclusion work with the Society of uh, Actuaries? Yeah. I'll start on, on that. And, you know, just to connect to your last point, Dr. Mackey, one of my first bosses who hired me, um, her degree was in mathematics. She was an actuary. I, sorry, was in music. I'm sorry, was in music. She had her degree in music and she became an actuary. So wow. th there's definitely that tie to, you know, those, the parts of your brain that, that for somebody, especially who's very gifted in music, it's very linked to the same part of your brain that's, that's mathematical. So mm -hmm. I think that's pretty cool. Um, but as it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion, you know, for me as, you know, a Black actuary um, coming from the Caribbean island of Barbados um, and, and now working in the U.S., um, you know, there, there's a lot of things that I see that that are different from, like, my experience growing up um, in a school, in a culture where 
I was not a minority. And, and that's something that I always find very interesting now being in, in America. For 18 years of my life, growing up, going to school, I was not a minority. So that was never something that was in my mindset, in my concept, in my framing. I, I you know, going to high school and having my math teachers and having, you know, the people that I looked up to as I th thought about what my career was going to be, they looked like me. So seeing, believing, understanding that I could do and be anything that I wanted to be um, wasn't, wasn't a barrier as I thought about the, the next steps in my career, you know, kind of thinking about being the only. And moving to the U.S., um, suddenly that was in my consciousness in a way that was very different than, um, you know, tuning into American television um, you know, from Barbados and things like that, but kind of living it every day and kind of coming into that experience of being a minority, having never kind of thought about myself in, in, in those terminologies before. And it, it's kind of very interesting to kind of almost take a step back on, on your life and your perspective and your realities and seeing it differently and also seeing somebody else's perspectives. And for me, like having those experiences and having that awareness um, one of the first places that I got involved from a professional perspective very quickly after I graduated and moved to the U.S. is the International Association of Black Actuaries. And the mission of that organization um, that's linked very closely to the Society of Actuaries, which is, you know, like Joe said, the largest organization for actuaries in, in the world. Um, the, the mission of the International Association of Black Actuaries is to increase the number of black actuaries and to increase the influence, to increase um, the presence the development of, of Black actuaries around the world. And that, that mission very much resonated with me, um, especially, you know, when I started my American experience. And um, I think globally, the number of Black actuaries is under 250. And Joe can confirm the number of actuaries registered in the SOA, but 250 Black actuaries around the world, like some number like less than that. It's like one, two, three, five, 10, 20. Yes. 200, 250. Yes. Five, zero. <laughs> yeah. A, a number in that range. It's a very small number and, and a very small profession. So when it comes to somebody like going back to where I started, being able to, you know, look out and look around and see somebody who looks like you um, in a profession that you aspire to be, that can be very challenging to kind of build that mindset that, oh, that can be me, I can do that. The number of Latinx actuaries is lower. The number of Native American actuaries is even lower. <laughs> um, so, you know, the, you know, and that's a focus that the that Society of Actuaries has in partnership with organizations that support um, the members of those communities. Some of the aspects that we think about um, and that we're focused on from a diversity, equity, and inclusion perspective is one, you know, where I started with the barriers. So like when I came to the US, kind of not seeing entry to this profession as a barrier and defining what are some of the barriers that somebody, uh, that, 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 that a young person might see entering this profession. The first one is awareness. Like we, we started, you know, at the beginning, what is even this word actuary? It's not necessarily a part of somebody's vocabulary um, on a regular basis. There's the, the, the awareness of what can you do with the application of mathematics, another question, question that we started with. All those types of things are, are just right there at a, a boundary. If you don't know about something, it's not something that you can go after and pursue and have an opportunity to, to, to develop in. So really appreciate the work that you guys are doing to bring awareness to, to more STEM professions and to have this opportunity to talk. Once you have awareness, it's kind of very fundamental stepping stone. The next aspect is um, how do you think about access and kind of, you know, getting into that profession? Joe talked about the exam process that that follows, um, you know, graduation and, and things like that. And some of this, the, the um, research that the Society of Actuaries did in, co in collaboration with other partner organizations suggests that minority students are less likely to continue along the process because of that continued exam process. The, the, the idea and the approach to failure can seem very final and failure is very much a part of a, a profession that has a qualification exam process associated with it. And building that idea and that um, not finality associated with a failure 
is very challenging, especially if you come from a community where, you know, um, it may signal to a parent or somebody who's, you know, supporting this person, well, you're not good enough to do this. You need to kind of find something else to do. It can feel very ultimate. And having the supports, having mentors, having other people who are along that path saying, no, nope, pick yourself up. You can do it again. Failure is a part of the process. We, we keep going. We keep moving. We support each other. And, and having those supports in place is so fundamental um, to increasing that access and increasing people continuing along the path to be an actuary. Um, and and the, for, for me, those are kind of, you know, the, the first steps as we think about you know, in, increasing access to, to the profession and, and, and increasing the number of minority actuaries. There are a lot of programs that the Society of Actuaries has in place to support those two things, to support education, as well as to support continued um, access and continue, people continuing along the path. Joe, can you talk about them? Maybe like the STARS program, like that one's really cool and real, like, it's one of my favorites. Yeah, STEM STARS. Um, so that's a, a, a newer program where the SOA is the founding sponsor um, for this program that's being run by the Actuarial Foundations. So that's another actuarial organization that I think is important for us to, to you know, reference. Um, and we've got a close working relationship with them. So we had a, a gift uh, this past year to, to kick that program off. Um, and its primary goal is breaking down the barriers to entering the profession for high school students and supporting them through the college journey. So it starts with a scholarship. Um, I think there's going to be 20 scholarships uh, awarded in this first cohort this coming spring. Um, each one is for $20,000, so $5,000 over four years. Um, but then in addition to that financial support to those students, it also includes mentoring, tutoring, immersion experiences, and then these guaranteed internships. Um, so it's really trying to help you know, jumpstart that process for, for students who need that kind of support. And yeah, I'm, I'm really excited for, uh, you know, the Estway's role in it and then to see what kind of impact it's able to have. Okay, so Joe, here I am. I'm a sophomore junior in high school. I'm listening to this podcast. I'm good in math. You just talked about a scholarship. Hey, I need to know where can I go to find out about this scholarship? Yeah, so there's two things I'm going to recommend to you in that situation. One is, um, you know, Google STEM Stars Actuary. It'll come up. I could give you the link, but it's a lot of it'll be easier to just Google STEM Stars Actuary. It'll take you to the Actuarial Foundation's website. It's got everything you need on there, including how to, you know, to, to get involved with that. So um, I believe the foundation is starting with a lot of the high schools that it already has a relationship with through other programs that it runs, and it's going to be expanding from there. So all kinds of information for you there. Um, but then in addition, I do want to point out the SOA also has recently started an affiliate membership program. So that's mm -hmm. a free level of membership for anyone. It's really targeted at, I would say, you know, high school and junior high students who kind of picture themselves as having, you know, some level of interest in actuarial science, but it also is open to their teachers, guidance counselors, parents, anyone who has interest. Uh, Dr. Mackey, you could become an affiliate member of the Society of Actuaries if you'd like to. And I was going to talk about that. I wanted to know how can students STEM NOLA and STEM Global Action become a viable partner with the Society of Actuaries to help increase the diversity and that pipeline that you all need. That, that's the work that we do. Well, and so there's all kinds of stuff we should talk about for sure, because I think You'll there's do. a lot of things. But at, at the, at, as, a, as a starting point, that affiliate membership is what we're hoping that, you know, what we're looking to do with that is just increase that level of engagement with mm -hmm. people who are, you know, long before the point of taking exams and becoming members, the people who are, you know, Jamal has started with that first step of awareness, like helping to get to that first step of awareness and, and have it be more than just something they stumbled upon on a website, but something that becomes a relationship with us as an organization. Mm -hmm. So I would recommend that to to listeners too it's it is free literally free so just look up soa you know society of actuaries affiliate membership and 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 sign up that that'll be a good first step for a lot of people right. oh i have a question that did just a couple of things that's come up during the conversation uh first of all um uh, you know are are actuaries actually part of like what we're seeing now in sports when it comes to the use of data like how what athlete is drafted or not drafted, how many hours of, of athlete plays, you know, to risk injury, that is that an application of, of an actuary? 
Yeah, so in 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 smaller numbers right now, I would say it is there are, there are some actuaries who have uh, gone into that line of work, and and mm -hmm. as you can imagine the amount of data that's involved in sports analytics, it, it is kind of cool. a natural extension of what of what actuaries do. Um, I know we've also done actuarial research reports through the SOA on like the retirement plans for professional sports leagues and things like that. So there is there is some overlap with with the world of sports and actuarial science. And with the diversity pipeline, this is, math is a science. So where does the, how do you strike the balance of people coming into the pipeline who bring a different life experience and cultural mm -hmm. background who will see numbers in a different way sometimes? Like, how do you balance that? Like if, if let's say you were, you know, you survive, you're from New Orleans, you survived the hurricanes, you understand that there, there are people behind those numbers. Like, how is how do you balance the art and the science part of the actuary science? Yeah, I think that, I, I really like the way that you frame that up and, and understanding that there are people behind it and, and balancing the art and the science. And, you know, that, that's one thing that, um, there, there's a little joke that people make that actuaries, um, actuaries do it with 95% confidence. So there very much is this art behind the work of, of, of well, that's a math joke. <laughs> There's very much art behind the work that we do. It's not a precise science, um, you know, and, 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 and bringing in perspectives and, and forward looking perspectives and people perspectives are so important to the judgment aspects that go into to the work that actuaries do. There's a lot of judgment when it comes into, you know, running very complicated models and then thinking about how do you assess, how do you assimilate, how do you translate that information to impact, you know, decisions, um, situations that impact and affect people. That there's very much that aspect of, you know, those softer skills and, and understanding, um, you know, situations that people may be in, scenarios that somebody may may want to, um, you know, to be considering and, and, and aspect and different aspects of risk management from, from that perspective. It's really cool because like a lot of the, you know, we talked about big data as it relates to data science and things like that. Um, as you're assimilating and putting together a whole bunch of data, you really need that human judgment mm -hmm. to then make the conclusions and the judgments of what do you do with this information now? How do you leverage it? How do you use it? And that's a very important part of the skill set that you develop as an actuary, um, being adaptable and being nimble um, and using that intuition as you're making judgments and decisions that influence, um, you know, a lot of the, a, a lot of things in society. You know, in closing, I just want to say thank you all for bringing this, this awareness to the table. Uh, again, with my background in mathematics, when they said, hey, we have some actuaries that want to talk, I said, bring it on, because if people don't know, they'll never pursue. And if we can't put a face to the profession, many people like myself and you, Jamala, really believe that that's, that's not a place for us. That, that's something that we don't do. So we have to continue to uh, uplift the, the language and uplift the uh, exposure and awareness to communities so they can know that, you know, there's a, a with the old rap song, there's a million, a million naked jo million jobs in the naked city, right? And our kids and every kid can have a profession in mathematics. So thank you all for all that you do. Uh, STEM NOLA and STEM Global Action is here to, 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 to serve and be a partner with you all. Thanks for reaching out and thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having us. It's been an honor. Thanks to all of our guests and thanks to all of you for joining us again here at Let's Talk STEM. Thank you so much. Uh, please continue to follow us on all of our social channels and we'll see you next time. You've been listening to a STEM Global Action Podcast. Through our STEM-based programming, we put students on a path towards quality jobs in science, technology, engineering, and math. Visit us at www.stemglobalaction.com. Until next time, let's keep talking STEM.